الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Brothers and sisters in Islam, mothers here present today um, Today is a special day um, We began the uh, last 10 days So today is day number 20 and tonight is going to be the ninth of 21. So which is the first odd night. So the ninth starts just after Maghrib throughout till Fajr. So those are the times we have to use to gain the pleasure of Allah. Do istighfar and it could probably be the ninth of power or majesty. Laylatul Qadr. Allahu A'lam. <clears throat> so today we are starting um, Surah Al-Hujurat. I will do a little background for Surah Al-Hujurat. It was revealed in a time where there was a rivalry between the Quraysh and the Muslims, choosing between peacemaking in the process of Sulh Al-Hudaybiyah, the agreement um, that was done in a place called Hudaybiyah. So this surah was revealed, or this first part was revealed in a time where Sahabas, some of them were not happy with the Prophet's decision. And I'll go through the short story as introduction. So we're gonna have some sirah today. We're gonna to learn some sirah today before we start the surah, inshallah. So the Prophet saw in a dream, that Allah has uh, told him or given him the glad tidings that he was going to go for Umrah with the believers from Medina. So he woke up, he gave them the good news and he told them, let's do it now. Let's do it now. Okay, give me one minute. Maryam woke up, <laughs> subhanAllah. <clears throat> I'm sorry, sorry guys, uh, I had to go take care of that. I think I should be fine now. <clears throat> so I was discussing the story of Sulh al-Hudaybiyah. So they put on their ihram, they got ready, and um, they went further for the Umrah. So as they were going on their way, the news went to Quraysh that uh, the Muslims were coming. The Muslims were ready. They didn't want to stop this time. They wanted to go for the Umrah. They wanted to fulfill a last promise for them. So the Quraysh sent Khalid ibn Walid to go and waylay them, you know, to go and set an ambush for them. So Khalid ibn Walid went with 200 soldiers and went on their way to waylay them. 
they could see Khalid ibn Walid and his soldiers. And Khalid was waiting for an opportunity for when they are saying their salah so he could attack. But that was when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this, uh, the Salatul Khawf verse, how to pray when you are in a battle, such that at every time some people are standing, watching, while some people are in Ruku, while some are in Sujood, it's a very systematic prayer where you have to be on guard while you are praying your salah. So Khalid ibn Walid was not successful when he saw that. So he had to go back to the Quraysh and told the Quraysh about what is going on. So they tried to track them again, but they passed a different route, different from the usual route from Medina to Mecca. And they passed by a place called Hudaybiyya. So when they got there, the Quraysh had sent several people to tell them to go back, that they will not be, you know, they will not be welcome, blah, blah, blah. They said different things. Several people came. Rasul told them he's not going back. He's going. And then after a while, when the threat started coming, Rasul decided to say, okay, let's, let's, um, let's try to make peace. He sent Uthman bin Affan. He said, go talk to them. We're only coming to do Umrah. We are not coming to fight. Okay, we just want to do Umrah and go in peace. So Uthman bin Affan went and they kept waiting for Uthman bin Affan for a long time. They did not see Uthman bin Affan. So there was rumor going around that Uthman bin Affan has been killed. When they say Uthman bin Affan has been killed, when the, when the news got to the prophet and the Muslims, the prophet said, okay, now it's time for battle. How many of you will pledge to me in allegiance to fight now that they killed Uthman? So all the Muslims pledged to him in this called Bayatul Ridwan under a tree, the one in Surah Al-Fatih, some of them even pledged twice or three times, telling the Prophet with affirmation that will stand by you if the Quraysh actually killed Uthman, because the Quraysh had sent more than three people to us to warn us, and we never killed any of them. And the first person we are sending to them, they killed him. So after the Bayah, as they were preparing to prepare for battle, then Uthman bin Affan showed up. Uthman bin Affan showed up. And he's like, oh, Uthman bin Affan is alive. He's not dead. Ah, Uthman bin Affan brought good news. He said, yes. When he was there, they offered him that he's a special person. They respect him. They like him. He can perform Umrah. <laughs> he said, you, Uthman, perform Umrah. Nobody will disturb you and go back but we will not allow Rasul and the other people to come. Uthman said, I cannot perform Umrah except after Rasul has performed Umrah. So Uthman bin Affan came back and told them Quraysh are willing to negotiate and they will send a negotiator. So Quraysh sent a man called Suhail ibn Amr. So when Rasul saw Suhail ibn Amr coming, he said, oh, this is Suhail. Then it means Allah will make your thing sahula, sahula lakum amrukum. Say Allah has made your just from his name, Suhail, Sahal, ease. He said, if this is Suhail, it means Allah has made it easy for us. So Suhail came and said, now we we'll agree on these terms. First of all, you guys came unannounced. You have to go back, no Umrah for you this year, come back next year. The prophet said, I agree. The Sahabas were boiling. Then second, agreement, anyone who wants to join us, if somebody leaves your community as a Muslim, come to join the Quraysh, the person stays with us. And anyone who joins you, comes to join you, the person stays with you. Agreed. No battle for 10 years between us, no matter the conditions, no battle. We won't fight for no reason for 10 years. So far, so good, the prophet agreed. Then now comes the unpleasant part again. If anyone under the, the care of somebody, someone who's under a guardian, like the son of somebody or someone who's a slave of somebody, should run away from the Quraysh to the Muslims to accept Islam, you have to return that person to us. But if any one of you comes to us, whether he's under a guardian or not, we'll keep the person. That was unfavorable to the Muslims, but Prophet agreed. <laughs> 
Then Rasul said, is that all? They said, yes. He said, Ali, come write it down. So Ali radiallahu anhu was putting this agreement down, the pledge of allegiance uh, that the Quraysh, between the Quraysh and Rasul sallam. And he said, oh Ali, write, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. And then Suhail said, we don't know anything like Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Write Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ali was mad. Why would you argue with writing Bismillah? You say, right, Prophet said, right, Bismillahumma. He wrote it. And Prophet said, right, this is agreement between Muhammad, Rasulullah. This is the agreement between Muhammad, the Prophet, and Messenger of Allah. Then Suhail said, no, if we agree that you are a Prophet, if we accepted your Prophethood, we will not be prosecuting you. We don't believe you are a Prophet, right? This is agreement with Muhammad bin Abdullah. Ali said he will never write. It. Muhammad said, give me the paper. Show me where... Rasulullah is Muhammad erased Rasulullah. He said, put Ibn Abdullah. It's okay. So Muhammad was just patient the whole time. And then they finished the agreement. While they were finishing the agreement and concluding, somebody ran to the Emirate of the Muhammad. Somebody ran to them, the emissary, I mean, the people among the Prophet Muhammad, the, the companions where they were gathered at Hulibiyah from Mecca. The person said he wants to be a Muslim, that he's escaped. He wants to join Islam, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. He's been a Muslim and he's been finding time to escape. And guess who this person is? His name is Abu Jandal. He's the son of the man who was there to negotiate, Suhail Ibn Amr. Suhail saw his son <laughs> coming to join the Muslims and he said, no, Muhammad, we already signed this agreement. You are sending my son back with me. Suhail's son said he can't go back. Prophet consoled him. Prophet said, don't worry will come for you another time. Just go for now, be patient, Allah is with you. So Muhammad, in a way, honored the agreement. But the Sahabas were not happy with the conditions. So Muhammad told them, slaughter your animals here, shave your hair, let's go back home, no more this year. They did not shave, nobody shaved. Abu Bakr told Prophet, you are our leader, you shave. When you shave, we will shave. So Prophet shaved his head, then they shaved. Then Umar came to Rasul and asked, say, are we not the believers? Are they not the disbelievers? We don't get level past these people. Those who die among us in battle, are they not the martyrs who go to Jannah? And those who die among them are going to hell. Why do we accept such humiliation from them? And then the prophet said, I only follow Allah's command. And I promised you that we will go for Umrah, but I did not tell you it has to be this year. And Allah has asked me to honor these terms. So let's be patient. Umar was still not happy. Umar went to Abu Bakr to complain. Abu Bakr also consoled him that, you know, Rasul will not do anything except of what Allah has asked him to do. He will not just make a decision except Allah has guided that decision. So they went back to Medina. When they reached Medina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now revealed the beginning of Surah Al-Fatih. Inna fatahna laka fatha mubina. We have given you a victory. <laughs> when they now saw, when they heard the verse, they were all excited. So they knew that that Sulhudebiya was an opening for something bigger. They became extremely happy. And not very long from that time, a group of women came from Mecca accepting Islam, and the Prophet accepted them and did not turn them back because Allah revealed the verse to him saying that the agreement of Hudebiya was talking about men. He did not make any specification to women. So the women were not returned. And then another man came, Abu Basir. He escaped from two people who were mushrikun. They pursued him to the prophet and said, prophet, you have to return this man because he's under our care. And then the prophet honored their term and said, Abu Basir has to return. So Abu Basir, on his way returning back with them, he was able to sneak a sword from one of them and killed one of them. And the other one chased him away. And the other one ran to the prophet and said, this man has killed one of us and he's coming to kill me. And then the prophet told Abu Basir, what you have done is wrong. We cannot do that and we cannot still accept you, leave. So Abu Basir had to leave and find sanctuary after outside Medina. And then when Abu Jandal, the son of Suhail, heard about Abu Basir, Abu Jandal came to join Abu Basir. Before you know, those who accepted Islam that ran away from their masters, and they knew that this agreement will not make them come to Medina. They go to uh, this Abu Basir's camp outside Medina, and they started having a group of camps there, waiting until they can come to Rasulullah. At this point, Mark can't fear it, 
and they by themselves, the Quraysh, they came to Rasul and said, okay, let's abolish this rule of, if anyone comes from us, return the person because now they are running and going to places we don't even know. So if anyone comes from us, accept the person so that at least we'll know where the person is. So the Quraysh by themselves changed the rule and then Rasul accepted them all. So after this is when Rasul started writing to kings outside the Arabian Peninsula and Najashi of Ethiopia, remember Abyssinia, where the Muslims went during the first uh, pilgrimage after they were being tormented in Mecca before they migrated to Medina. The first migration was to Abyssinia, Ethiopia, to an Najashi. So the Prophet wrote in his letter in the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful, from Muhammad Rasulullah to the king, to Negus, the king of Abyssinia and Najashi. Peace be upon him who follows the true guidance. I entertains a last praise. There is no God but he, the sovereign, a bear witness. So he, he called him to Islam with beautiful words. And then an Najashi replied, Oh Muhammad, I have received your letter in which you have mentioned about Jesus. And by the Lord of the heaven and the earth, Jesus is not more than what you say. We fully acknowledge that which you have been sent to us and we have entertained your cousin and his companions, that's those who migrated. And I bear witness that you're a messenger of Allah. So he accepted Islam. Say, I surrender, I pledge to, to you through your cousin and surrender myself through him to the Lord of the world. So he was the first king to accept Islam and Najashi. And then he told them about Jaffa, those who migrated to him and they were still in his uh, company. And then the prophet asked him to send them back. And then he sent them back with two big ships and with lots of gifts, honoring prophet's uh, um, command. And when An-Najashi died, uh, the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed for him in his absence because he died as a Muslim. Then the prophet wrote to Maqaqis, Azim al Maqaqis read the letter the Prophet sent to him in the presence of Zikhet al-Kalbi, and he said, this is a calling to nothing but good and casting out evil, but he never openly accepted Islam. Instead, he sent two maidens to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu one of which the Prophet married and got the, the son Ibrahim from her. Then Kisra of Sasanian, the Sasanian king, read the letter of the Prophet and tore it. And then he sent two men to go and apprehend the prophet. Two soldiers say, go and apprehend this man. How can a slave be talking to a king like this? So when the men got to Medina and they said they are here to apprehend the prophet, prophet said, don't worry. What did Kisra do? He tore my letter. He said, Allah will tear his kingdom. Wait till tomorrow and then we'll discuss. By the time they waited till tomorrow, the prophet came to them and said, didn't you know what Allah has done to your king? He said, go and ask. And then they heard the news that Kisra has been killed by his own son. Then Qaisar was also written to another king. When he read the letter, he said, who knows this man from amongst his people? Abu Sufyan was there. Abu Sufyan was called and he said, who are those who accept the religion of this man? He said, the poor people. Does anyone accept his religion and return back? He said, no. He said, this is a true messenger of Allah. And trust me, this man will be a king and will take a position like my position. That was when Abu Sufyan knew that Rasulullah has been, you know, exalted in the presence of kings. He wrote to other kings, but we are not going to that. Herakla, the king of Rome, Oman, Egypt, Bahrain, etc. But this is just an intro to our tafsir today. Now, we have seen the background, why the Sahabas were not happy at that point when the Prophet accepted the, 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 the allegiance and the agreement between them. So we're going to start the surah, okay, immediately. So let's go to... Uh, Quran chapter 49, Surah Al Hujurat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi min ash shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu. La tuqaddimu bayna yaday illahi wa rasulih. Wattaqu Allah. Inna Allah sami'un alim. Um, then I will just, I, I don't want to read, I want to do the first three verses or four verses today. 
Let me see if I do. Let me just recite them all. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu. Verse 2. La tawfa'u aswatakum fawta sawtin nabi. Wa la tajaharu lahu bil qawl. Kajahri ba'dikum li ba'din an tahbata a'malukum. An tahbata a'malukum wa antum la tashurun. إن الذين يغضون أصواتهم عند رسول الله أولئك الذين امتحن الله قلوبهم للتقوى لهم مغفرة وأجر عظيم. Okay. Now the first verse says, O you who believed, do not put yourselves before Allah and His Messenger. Do not put your own want, your own needs before what Allah has said you should do. Indeed, Allah is hearing and knowing. So we, we already know the background of what's going on. They want to go for Umrah. They don't want to, they want to go, even if it leads to war, they want to, you know. Allah is reminding them, all you who believed in Allah, all you who believe in Allah's wisdom, in his guidance, in his magnificence, his highness, the one who is Al-Alim, the one who knows and hears all your side talk and all your grumbling, and the one who knows all unseen, if you believe that this is Allah, why are you doing this? Why are you putting your own ideas, your opinions before Allah and his Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? That's why in Quran, Surah Al-Hazab, chapter 33, verse 36, it says, wa ma It is not for a believing man or believing woman. When Allah and his messenger has decided a matter, for them to have any other choice about their affair. No, I'm going to do my own this way. I will not follow what Rasul Aslam said. And Rasul even does show. Rasul will call his people and say, let's analyze this situation. What do we do? Before he decides, he doesn't just come and impose his decisions. Most of the time he does show. Some of the times he tells them, this is what Allah said we should do. Is that okay? So it is not of us, when Prophet said, keep the beard, you say, no, I want to cut my beard. The Prophet said, you know, don't do this. You say, no, no. we are short trousers. No, 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 we are long trousers. You know, these are little, little signs of disobedience here and there. Put on your hijab, like the way the wives of the Prophet and the Muslims did. No, 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 me, I'll do like this. You know, you're having your own choices. So Allah said, it is not befitting for a believer to do this. Okay, in Surah to Ali Imran, Say, obey Allah and the messenger. Allah wa Rasul. In another verse, Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 92, obey Allah and obey the messenger. So there's this always, let's obey Allah. Let's not put ourselves before Allah. This has to do with how we love Allah. If you say you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will put Allah's needs before your needs. Is that okay? You love, you show that you love Allah sincerely. By, by favoring Allah over your desires and your wants. So verse number two says, Ya you ladina amanu, la tarfaw aswata. Now we are coming to manners. So some of, some of you will start raising your voice over Rasulullah because you are angry, because you want to prove a point. He said, do not raise your voices above the voice of the prophet or be loud to him in speech, like the loudness like you do to yourselves. Lest your deeds become worthless while you don't know, while you perceive not. So even Allah, his creator, who created the prophet, does not address the prophet rudely. He always says, Ya Ayyuhan Nabi. He always calls him, Oh, my messenger. Oh, the prophet. Oh, then you, human beings, you fellow Sahabas, will now be treating him like that. Himself, the Rasul, is the best of his people. He never, he's a role model. He never raises his voice at you, and you raise your voice at him. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Indeed, a good example of character has been given to you in Rasulullah. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفَسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِدْكُمْ A messenger has been brought from amongst you. عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِدْكُمْ حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَأُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ He is keen for you as believers. Ra'ufun Rahim, he's kind, he's mild, he, he's keen that you become Muslims and believers. And he's so keen on, you know, he's so mild and kind with you. And this is how you want to treat him. So this is a verse that teaches us manners of approach for all of us to emulate, to learn in general, not just the Rasulullah or if we address the Rasulullah. 
Even when we knock at the door to enter somebody's house, the prophet told us, when you knock three times, nobody answers, you go back. And a man came to the prophet, knock at his door, the prophet said, who's there? He said, Anna. The prophet said, Anna, Anna, Anna. What do you mean, Anna? Ka'annahu karihaha. You don't say Anna, Anna. You have to state your name when someone says who's at the door. The prophet is telling us manners. We know the one who, the, the one who the, the one who served the prophet for 20 years and he was asked about the prophet. He said, the prophet, with all my years of service, he never asked me, why did you do this? Or why did you not do this? He never raised his voice at me. These are the mannerisms we know of the prophet. And this is what we should emulate as Muslims. The prophet said, I was sent only to perfect the best of manners. Nothing gets people in paradise in other narration more than good manners. He said, I didn't see anything that takes people to paradise more than good man. And we've seen that the hadith of two women that were told that the prophet, one was very prayerful, but she wasn't good in good terms with her neighbors. The prophet said she's in hell. The other one was not too prayerful, not too religious, but she had good manners. She was good with her neighbors. They loved her. The prophet said she's in gender. It's so easy for you to know that good manners pay if cleanliness can pay. The prophet said, iman. cleanliness is part of it. What about good manners? That was why when Aisha radiallahu anha was asked about Rasulullah sallallahu and his character, he said, Kana Quran. His character was a summary of the Quran. If you want to know how the Prophet behaved, look at the Quran. Then verse 3 continues. Indeed, those who lower their voices before the Messenger of Allah. Those are the ones whose heart has tested for righteousness. Litmus test. They have passed the litmus test of righteousness. For them is forgiveness and great reward. So good manners is obviously part of taqwa, like I said. Okay, And it goes not just to human beings, even animals. We've seen the hadith of someone who gave a water or drink to an animal and Allah forgave all their sins. So we need to be kind to one another. We need to treat each other kindly. Our husbands, our wives, our family members, our grandparents who are old. Some of us see them as disgusting and throw them far away from us. We have to be kind to even our friends that are non-Muslims, our any neighbors we have, we have to show the best of character, the best of kindness. And some of us, when we get mad at home, we raise our voice, we want to shout to your wife, you, are you stupid, you talking to me like that? You know, you know, because you are mad, you have to control that. Try as much as possible. Present your situation without shouting. Can we talk about this? Because I'm not happy with what happened, can we? You know, even if you are boiling inside, let the thought of Surah Al-Hujurat, the thought of the mannerism of Rasulullah, calm you down. Say, oh, I just listened to this tafsir. Let me try and be better. Even if what you, one of the things you get from Ramadan is to calm yourself down and be better in the way you relate with your spouse. Maybe you used to be the Yagba Lagba, the Jaga Jaga woman. You know, you'll tie your waist. Hey, you'll kill me today. You'll kill me today. You, no, calm down. If you used to be the Wahala man who give the wife tough time, make her cry for no reason. You know, some men just enjoy watching their wives cry and they're like, yeah, yeah, I'm winning. It's not prideful. It's not something to be prideful about. You are hurting that woman. And you know you are, you are being proudful about it because you think you are winning. It's not a win-win affair. This is a relationship. Put yourself in her shoes. You know, just because they cry easily doesn't mean you make them cry. Yeah? Don't wait till Allah make you cry. That would be worse. So change, let's change our ways with the way we interact with our spouses, with the way we interact with our children. Some of us always scream at our children, come here, shut up, idiot, shut up. are you stupid? Relax. They will hear you if you are mad, they will hear you. The, the, the more soft you are with your kids, with your family members, with your children, and that's how they will treat you too when they grow up. But when they see you shouting at their mom, beating their mom, they'll think it's okay to do that. When they grow up, they'll do the same thing to their spouses. Then we go to verse number four. Indeed, those who call you from behind the chambers, from the back door, the window, most of them do not use reason. They don't understand. How can you be coming to backyard of Prophet House? Hey, Prophet Afa, Prophet, hey, Muhammad, Muhammad, hey, you open with, hey, Prophet Afa. Habba. Prophet has duties to humanity, duties to his family, and duties of himself, to his, to, to his immediate family and himself and his wives. And you are coming to interfere. You don't know what he's doing in there. You're just coming to interfere, coming to cause problems. Don't you reason? Can you even do that to your friends? 
You just go to, even if you do that, not the prophet, he's, he's someone who has lots of things going on. So you have to treat him, come through the front, seek permission, see if he's available, see if he will see you. Not coming to spy through the window, hey, Afa, you are knocking. Uh, doing that to the prophet. So we need to learn these manners and then we need to try as much as possible to do better. So for these last 10 days, um, what I'll be doing is after the tefsir, I'll save some time, five minutes. I want to talk on some motivational speech. I want to motivate us this Ramadan, these last 10 days to do get better. So every tefsir from today, after the tefsir, we'll have five minutes of motivational speech. And uh, I want to start that today because I have to go take care of something. So I'll do the motivational speech now. Um, and then we'll take questions and answers if we have some. Um, Okay, I'll make it interactive. So what do you, who is gonna suggest what you want to get motivated about in this last 10 days? What do you feel weak about that you want someone to ginger you, someone to, you know, to, you know, charge you, to recharge you about? So I want suggestions and then I'll choose. I'll choose from the first three people who will suggest something that they want to be motivated about. And we'll talk about it today. And then from tomorrow, inshallah, I'll have some motivation prepared. Somebody suggested this yesterday okay somebody mentioned prayer point which is good what do i say when i'm in sujood prayer point reading the quran so everybody now is talking about dua and prayer alhamdulillah well the first thing about prayer point is first of all seek for forgiveness because some of us we are looking for things and allah has not really forgiven us of the past sins we have done so the first prayer point i want you to do is forgiveness. That is why the dua the Prophet say in at 19 Ramadan, you know, Allahumma inna ka'afu wun tuhibbu la'afu wa'afu wa'afu You say, oh Allah, you are the one who pardons. You like to pardon. Pardon me. The Prophet in Laylatul Qadr, in the last 10 days, Aisha said, this is the dua he prayed during Taraweeh. This, so the first thing, ask Allah to pardon you. When Allah has forgiven you, you are not his friend again. You are not back in good terms. Hey, you cannot say, ah, Allah, hey. Find me smoking. <laughs> Allah, do your boy, do your boy, do your boy. Urgent 2K. <laughs> you understand? You gotta say Allah. Uh, you know? Well, so you have to gain the pleasure of Allah first. So when you have not broken that bridge, you cannot ask Allah for urgent 2K. Or ask Allah to do you, to do you, you know, to send your boy something. You know, say Allah, your 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 girl day, your Aja day, Allah, raising my side now. So you have to tell Allah to forgive you to pardon you, seek for sincere forgiveness, tell Allah I'm sorry. And we have the power of forgiveness. The prophet said the greatest, the father of dua for forgiveness, the dua of forgiveness, the greatest dua of forgiveness is saying, Allahumma anta rabbi, la ilaha illa ant, khalaqtani wa ana abduk, wa ana ala ahdik, wa wa'adika mastata'at, a'udhu bika min sharri ma sanat, abu'u laka bi ni'matika alayya, wa abu'u bi zambi, faghfir li fa innahu la yaghfiru dhunuba illa ant. I have some dua I compiled before where we usually recite in the mornings and in the evenings. I wrote them by hand and transliteration. I've sent it to some students here before. I will send it to Raisa so she can share on the WhatsApp group. You see the translation of all the duas. Read them through, see the ones that resonate with you and say in this Ramadan, I'm going to do this. And look even for more duas. Duas know they finish. Duas have plenty. And then focus on your major problem. Is it your, after you've sought for forgiveness, is it your husband that's giving you trouble? Is it your marriage that's on that problem? Is it your family members, your mother-in-law? So that particular thing, is it your job? You're looking for job or you're looking for husband? You're looking for wife? That particular thing that has been troubling you on your life, this is the time to make it a prayer point. So number one, seek for forgiveness, seek the pleasure of Allah. When you are Allah, become friends, say Allah, forgive me, forgive me. Allah, it's okay, I forgive you. Say, Allah, reason your boy now. You are, you are going through this challenge. Allah, help me. Help me. Help me. You are the only one that can help me. You know, so it is like that. So when you now ask Allah that particular thing that is troubling you, your family member, some of us have peaceful homes. We don't have much troubles. Still tell Allah to protect you. Now, when you are in that point where you are living a good life, your husband is good, your family life is good, you don't have any trouble, your work, your business is fine, seek for protection. Because evil people fool everywhere, but let's say Allah protect my children, protect me from the seen and the unseen. You know, protection is something to seek for as a prayer point in this Ramadan. Seek for protection. Is that okay for your family, for your business, for everything you do in your life? And then, um, yeah, those are three major prayer points I've said. Um, seeking for forgiveness, something particular about your life you want Allah to help you with, 
and then seeking for protection for your family, your businesses, and your kids. I know some of you are struggling with your mothers, your fathers, your, you know, a lot of different challenges. This is the time to do those. And you can do those in sujood. So the prophet used to pray for the sujood. When you are praying a voluntary prayer at night, you can stay in sujood, a ruku, as long as you want, make it dua. Okay. I know ruku is much more difficult, but sujood is, you can relax. Don't go and fall asleep in sujood, making dua. But Allah will still reward you if you mistakenly fall asleep. Allah will continue to, you know, Allah say if you are reciting the Quran, the prophet said, and you fall asleep, angels will keep rewarding you like the Quran is still recited. I'm not saying when you're asleep, you go recite Quran and sleep because you want to play while you. I'm just saying. So the point is, find the most comfortable position when you're in sujood, that's where you're closest to Allah. Use that opportunity to pray and ask Allah all these different things. And nothing is too much for Allah to answer. Nothing, nothing is too much. And that's why I say, don't raise your voice, even to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember when the Sahabas used to pray, they say, Allah, Akbar. I say, why are you shouting? Allah, you are calling, is closer to you than your vein. You don't need to shout for him to hear you. Just the same tefsir. So you don't need to shout, make your dua calmly. You don't need to shout like the Christians and jump up and down, hit your body and toss some assault. That is not when Allah will answer your prayer. Be calm about it, you know? Um, yeah. So reading the Quran at night, uh, yeah, it's good uh, when you recite the Quran at night. If that is your dhikr, it's fine. If you don't have, you finished your dua and you are still awake, just recite the Quran. It's part of the things that will intercede. Fasting will intercede. The Quran will intercede that I kept him awake at night when his mates were sleeping. So it's a good, it's a form of dua and worship also to recite Quran. And then now, is it best to pray 10 raka'ah for one hour or to pray two raka'ah for one hour, two long raka'ah for one hour? So the ulama have deliberated about this and they agree that staying long in prayer is better than praying short, short prayer for the same period of time. So just giving you heads up. But if you can't stand too long, you want to cut your prayer, it's understandable. Do that. They are all acceptable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The most important thing is our sincerity. Let's be sincere. And this is the time to give zakat. Is that okay? Um, this is the time to give zakat. Those of you that have been waiting to give zakat, it's now. Okay, this is the time. And, and uh, by the way, I want to say thank you to all those who contributed something and sent to me. Jazakumullah khairan. May Allah reward you. I wasn't expecting it. So you put, you put charge me. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Rais, I know you're going to fight me now. I'm sorry, Rais. I just had to say Jazakumullah khairan to all uh, the students here and our mothers here who did that. May Allah bless you abundantly. And um, so this is the time to give zakat, help the poor. So some of you, if you can't wake up to pray, you are lazy. Sadaqah is fine. Give sadaqah. Send money to poor people. You know, you still find that peace of mind and Allah will still accept it and multiply it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I have some questions and answers. Uh, concentration in solar to stop backbiting. Believing that forgiveness is always possible with Allah. Can we make dua after the final tashahud before salam? Uh, it's not known, but the scholars all agree you can make dua anywhere other than um, uh, when you are standing reciting. You can make dua any other place. So khair, inshallah. Making amends at home with spouse. I just mentioned that. Is it compulsory? No. The best prayer of women is in their homes. But if you feel better praying in the masjid, women pray in the masjid in the time of Rasul and after that's welcome, but your best prayer is still at home. So those who pray at home have more reward than those praying in the masjid. No scholar argues that. Okay, we'll talk more. Now I have more points, inshallah. Now I know what to focus on in our motivation, inshallah. Tomorrow we'll start after our tafsir, we'll talk about something different, general, some just a five, 10 minutes talk to motivate us and you know make us to ginger us a little bit in this uh, last 10 days. Um, I have to run now. I'll say salam alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And I'll see you guys tomorrow, continuing from verse number um, um, four. <clears throat> Somebody said, did I say we should not make dua standing? Yes, when you are when you are reciting the Quran, oh, the point I wanted to make is when you go for sujood, the scholars do not allow, they say you can make dua all the other parts except reciting Quran. That's the point I wanted to make. You should not recite Quran in your sujood, except it's a part of Quran that is a dua. You are making a dua like Rabbana Atina Fiduni Hasana. That's the point I wanted to make. Sometimes there's a narration the Prophet would make dua after reciting Fatiha, standing before Ruko or after Ruko. So that one is permissible. Thank you for pointing that out. I just had to clarify that point. Okay, I'll see you guys uh, next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.